So um, welcome everyone. I can see um, people trickling in. Um, the participant numbers are rising, which is lovely. Um, I'd like to just start by saying um, thank you to uh, the Association of Physicians for hosting um, this webinar on women's um, reproductive health. And I will just start sharing my screen. Hopefully you can all um, see that. Um, and thank you very much um, for joining today. My name is um, Abigail Fraser, and I am a professor of epidemiology at uh, the Bristol Medical School. I am a population scientist, and my research focuses on women's reproductive health across the life course and how it affects both their mental health and other aspects of physical health, um, such as cardiometabolic health, which I will be um, telling you a bit more about um, in a minute. Um, I am going to try and see if my slides will move. Yep. So um, hopefully you can uh, see that, which is uh, just the promo um, for today's um, webinar. And just to briefly introduce um, our speakers, I've said a couple of words about um, myself. After me, uh, Professor Marianne Knight um, will be speaking about pregnancy medicine and why um, it matters for all physicians. After her, um, Dr. Charlotte Fries will be telling us about um, the relatively new maternal medicine networks. Um, and finally, Professor Martha Hickey will be um, speaking to us about empowering women um, to manage the menopause. And so just before I launch into um, the actual webinar um, for today, um, this is to signpost you to the annual um, meeting in Liverpool in on the 20th and 21st um, of April 2023 and the link um, to further information about this um, annual um, meeting of the AOP. So um, without further ado, um, given that we really do want to kind of keep um, talks relatively um, short, so around 10 minutes each, and keep the um, conversation, or at least the digital online one, going. So um, just to ask everyone, if you can, uh, please do put your um, questions or comments in the Q&A, and um, we will have uh, ample time for uh, discussion or for uh, to answer your questions after um, all four of the speakers today um, have finished their presentations. And I will monitor um, that um, chat and, um, and present those questions to um, the panelists. So I'm a bit of an outlier on the uh, panel today in that I won't be talking about um, women's um, reproductive health as an outcome uh, per se, but actually as a sex-specific marker of a woman's cardiovascular disease risk in um, later life. And I wanted to start um, by this very um, eloquent quote by John Mason Good, who um, 200 years ago um, said that with the exception of the stomach, there is no organ that holds such numerous ramifications of sympathy with other organs as the womb. And this observation, um, as I said, 200 years ago since has really been evidenced again and again. And we now have a very large and convincing body of evidence showing that these indicators of women's reproductive health across the life course from childhood or adolescence, um, so age at menarche and um, characteristics of menarche through to early adulthood when a woman might be diagnosed with PCOS, endometriosis, may um, be prescribed um, oral contraception, um, go through a pregnancy, which might be complicated by something like hypertension, uh, 
a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, um, premature delivery, um, or a very small baby, a growth restricted baby, um, then through to um, her final parity, so how many children she has, whether she was able to, and for how long she might have breastfed her offspring, um, and through to menopause, which, as I said, Martha will be telling us more about, um, on, and, and the symptoms of uh, menopause, so vasomotor symptoms, all of these, we now have a really consistent body of evidence linking them to a woman's um, cardiovascular disease risk in later life. And the one that I am going to focus on a bit today is one that I'm particularly interested in, and that is adverse pregnancy outcomes, APOs. And so um, this slide really is just a summary of one of, of several systematic reviews um, and meta-analyses looking at various um, complications of pregnancy and those two terms are kind of interchangeable, APOs, complications of pregnancy, um, and um, their associations with cardiovascular disease outcomes in later life. And the column highlighted in red or that has a red square um, around it really shows you that the um, effect estimates are kind of uh, relatively um, consistent and around a doubling of increased risk associated with the different pregnancy complications or um, APO and later cardiovascular disease in Paris women. But we all know that association isn't um, necessarily causation. And the nature of the relationship between um, adverse pregnancy outcomes and um, cardiovascular uh, disease in later life, so whether it is in fact um, reflecting a causal effect or is driven by um, shared uh, risk factors denoted here by C or confounders such as genetics or adiposity. So this question around the nature of this association is not um, simply an intellectual one, which I think is quite interesting in its own right, but also has implications for prevention and treatment targets. So if we take, for example, what we now know, um, and we do know there's consistent evidence that earlier age at menarche is associated with increased cardiovascular disease risk in later life, it is very likely that um, increased adiposity and perhaps genetics um, actually um, explain both the earlier age at menarche here denoted by X and the increased um, cardiovascular disease risk um, or Y. So if we now bring that back to the adverse pregnancy outcomes, we really, um, so if we try and ask, um, are hypertensive disorders of pregnancy causing cardiovascular disease risk in mom in later life through end organ damage potentially, or are they simply picking up women who have um, an increased propensity for cardiovascular disease? And these three scenarios um, that you can see here in front of you really tell, um, are, are trying to summarize in, in cartoon form those um, three options. So here in scenario one, there's no effect of this placental syndrome or adverse pregnancy outcome on cardiovascular health, which is, um, or cardiometabolic dysfunction on the y-axis. And you can see that women um, in red who do develop, uh, as say, a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, they actually have a higher or a more adverse cardiometabolic um, health profile prior to pregnancy, which then becomes an adverse pregnancy outcome, but they track just higher um, on that risk, on that y-axis compared to women um, in the blue who do not have an adverse pregnancy outcome. On the other hand, it's entirely possible, as in scenario um, two here in panel B, that every all women start 
um, at the same level of risk. But those who do develop a pregnancy complication post pregnancy, kind of their risk takes off and increases compared to um, women who don't have an adverse pregnancy outcome. And these two kind of the, the fact that um, this cardiometabolic dysfunction rises for both of these groups is because we know that that's what happens during pregnancy, even a completely normal and healthy pregnancy. And finally, this um, third scenario, and they're not mutually exclusive, is basically saying all women start the same um, in terms of their cardiometabolic dysfunction pre-pregnancy, but those women who go on to have a healthy pregnancy actually benefit from having a healthy pregnancy in terms of their cardiovascular risk. And that might sound a bit counterintuitive, but actually, when we look at data from the very unique Hunt study that has repeat measures of various cardiovascular um, phenotypes, um, so blood pressure, adiposity, um, CRP, lipids, what we see is that for blood pressure and each kind of break in these figures is showing when a woman had a pregnancy. And you can see that the women, um, so the very light gray here are um, nulliparous women. And here are women who've had, and this is the first pregnancy, a second and a third. We're looking at systolic and diastolic blood pressure. And you can see that those actually do fall um, most substantially after the first pregnancy, but also after the second and third, which is kind of in line in what, with what that um, panel C was showing. When we compare, on the other hand, women who have had a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy versus those who've had a normal, healthy pregnancy, again, what you can see here is that, um, like we showed on panel B of that cartoon, the um, systolic and diastolic, BMI, waist circumference, those four panels um, are denoting, are showing those four um, cardiometabolic risk factors. You can see that for women with a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, if we look here at systolic blood pressure, they start higher before pregnancy. It drops maybe a tiny bit, although confidence intervals are overlapping, but then they track. And this is suggesting compared, of course, to the, sorry, the dark line, which is women with a healthy pregnancy, suggesting that women who do develop a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy have that increased blood pressure or higher blood pressure on average, even before pregnancy. So another interesting question is, does women's reproductive health and um, health during pregnancy have a role in cardiovascular disease prediction? So for example, if here we might take a pooled cohorts equation or Q risk three, whatever it is, and see whether we um, do, if we add information on hypertensive disorders of pregnancy here in this red box, does that um, change um, their predicted risk of a cardiovascular disease outcome in later life? And actually, there have been several studies um, to say that it, the, the pregnancy complications and information about them doesn't um, substantially or significantly or meaningfully change their uh, predicted odds of, heart, of having a cardiovascular disease suggesting, and there have been several studies, suggesting that adding in a formal um, information about health in pregnancy, um, adding that information does not increase um, the accuracy of the prediction. So then what does um, women's health in pregnancy um, tell us? And again, this is just to um, kind of signpost to what, how can it help? So even if formally um, this doesn't help with cardiovascular disease risk, prediction. If you think about it, these are young women. Um, it tells us their health in pregnancy, something uh, early on during the life course um, where we actually can do something and may in fact have implications and really should have implications for healthcare provision because it tells us as clinicians something about a woman's um, cardiovascular disease risk in later life and provides kind of a, a warning sign um, and perhaps kind of alerts um, 
healthcare providers to increase monitoring um, and screening of these young women who have had a um, adverse pregnancy outcome or a complication of pregnancy. So I will um, leave that whistle stop tour with you um, there. Say thank you very much. And uh, I will stop sharing um, my screen. And um, I have the absolute pleasure to um, introduce um, Professor Marianne Knight, who is our next speaker. Marianne is a public health physician, a professor of maternal and child population health at the University of Oxford, whose research focuses on severe complications of pregnancy. And amongst her many, many roles, um, she leads the national confidential inquiries into maternal deaths and thus has responsibility for investigating the care of all women who die during pregnancy in, in the year or in the year, sorry, after pregnancy in the UK or Ireland. Marianne, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abby. So I just want to get uh, everybody on the same page um, in terms of thinking about what the main causes of maternal death are. In the UK and um, other developed um, high resource settings, the majority of women die uh, from medical and mental health causes and not from um, uh, typical pregnancy associated causes. So for example, uh, you can see the, the solid bars here are what we call indirect causes of, of uh, maternal death. So um, uh, those medical causes that, that you as physicians would largely be managing. And you can see that we don't actually get specific pregnancy related causes of, of maternal death until much further to the right. So uh, very small numbers, uh, particularly when we're thinking about conditions such as preeclampsia. And that's even more obviously um, uh, shown when we look at the WHO maternal mortality classification. And you can see that more than half of women die from uh, non obstetric complications. Um, I mentioned that cardiac disease uh, remains the, the leading cause of death, and that has been the leading cause of death uh, for uh, around about the last 20 years. Um, and this is a very typical uh, uh, woman's death that we see. Uh, and I'd like you just to, to read this uh, vignette and at the same time, uh, in, in your head, replace a pregnant woman uh, with a 50 year old man um, and I would defy any of you to miss the diagnosis of, uh, of um, uh, cardiac disease in this case uh, but because the woman was pregnant um, the, her pain was assumed to be uh, due to other causes and so we have to reiterate with heart disease that it can occur in pregnancy for the first time and symptoms such as chest pain are, are clear red flags. Uh, same risk factors that you would see in a non-pregnant population um, and basic things such as breathlessness, which many people assume to be normal in pregnancy, is certainly not normal if you're breathless at rest and particularly when lying flat. And I just want to draw your attention to this pie chart in, in the corner um, and such that of the women who die from cardiovascular disease during uh, or after pregnancy, three quarters of them are not known to have uh, cardiac disease before they become pregnant. So acquired heart disease is a really important um, uh, cause to be aware of. Neurological conditions are the second most frequent cause of death and of particular concern uh, in recent years is uh, uh, maternal death due to SUDEP, sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. Um, and the reason being um, that we've had a big change in, in prescriptions of, of um, anti-epileptics, the Valproate Pregnancy Prevention Program um, uh, now requires uh, women of reproductive age uh, not to be uh, uh, taking Valproate unless they've got um, uh, uh, um, long-acting um, 
contraception in place. But as a consequence, we've actually found that women's uh, epilepsy management has got much worse. And when we look at the women who die from epilepsy, uh, a quarter were not taking any medication. And in several cases, that was not picked up by the uh, medical teams caring for her. Uh, fewer than a quarter had a documented pre-pregnancy counselling. Um, less than a third had a specialist review during pregnancy. And the majority had uncontrolled epilepsy pre-pregnancy. Um, and after assessment, uh, for more than two thirds, uh, our, our assessors felt that improvements in care would have changed the difference, would have meant that those women didn't die. Um, and, and this, again, was a, a, a typical example of a woman who had uh, discontinued her um, anti-epileptics because she was concerned it might harm her baby. She was referred to the emergency department because she'd had increased seizure frequency, but no change in her management was made. And she was just referred back to her GP. Uh, she was deemed to be at high risk and a, a referral was made for further assessment, but uh, she died from SUDEP two days later uh, before seeing either a neurologist or an obstetrician. Um, and certainly in many areas, a, a routine appointment with a neurologist can have a waiting list as long as nine months, which, as you can appreciate, is, is of no use for pregnant women. Um, and this is a recurring message that we see in the confidential inquiries that we have to, when we're thinking about medication and investigations in pregnancy, we must think about the benefits to the woman and her pregnancy, as well as any uh, risks. And all too often, there's a, a conversation is based entirely around risk without thinking about benefits. Um, very simple messages. Um, uh, we need to talk about uh, SUDEP and, and make sure that we are discussing risk factors uh, with women and particularly thinking about ineffective treatment. Um, venous thromboembolism is also a, a leading cause of death and uh, the women who are now dying are uh, very young and uh, particularly uh, overweight and uh, obesity is a, is a very important risk factor in the pregnant population. Um, and the importance that we need to think about in pregnancy is that increased risk starts very early. Uh, so um, uh, several women, uh, as, it, as with this one, uh, actually die in the first trimester. So again, a recurring message is the need for pre-pregnancy counselling and for women who've, got, who've had a previous VTE to be thinking about a, a, a prospective management plan. So all of these plans uh, need to be done uh, out, outside of, of maternity services. We have substantial ethnic disparities in maternal mortality rates. And we um, ha ha observed this particularly in the uh, COVID pandemic. And this woman um, almost has a, a full house of the uh, uh, potential biases in care. Uh, she was pregnant, but yet her um, uh, condition was assessed with a with a new score rather than a, a maternity specific early warning score. Her respiratory rate was extremely high, but it was assumed that that was due to pregnancy. Um, dexamethasone was considered, but not given because she was pregnant. Uh, and our assessors felt that because she was Asian, she had brown skin, uh, the severity of her sickness uh, was not um, uh, picked up. Uh, and sadly she died. And um, biases in the care of uh, women from Black and Asian groups have been particularly noted in terms of uh, the, the lack of culturally uh, appropriate care uh, and still um, observing some, some microaggressions, some um, uh, assumptions made um, un inappropriately. Um, we also see biases in care looking at, um, uh, for example, uh, uh, research. So women were exclude, pregnant women were excluded from the initial vaccine trials in COVID, which led to high levels of hesitancy. And we're still seeing significant hesitancy 
um, and you can see a very clear uh, relationship with, with severe outcomes amongst uh, unvaccinated pregnant women, even in the era of Omicron. We still see women who are not being imaged appropriately during pregnancy. Um, and in this case, um, women uh, with, whose, whose cancer was undiagnosed. But similarly, we've also seen women who have inappropriate operations during pregnancy because staging of their cancers has not been fully undertaken. So I'm going to leave it at that point and just point you to the, uh, the infographic from our uh, latest maternal mortality report and, and the words that surround this circle. Uh, treat women who may become pregnant, are pregnant or have recently been pregnant, the same as a non-pregnant person, unless there's a very clear reason not to. And if you're at all concerned about how to do that, uh, contact your maternal medicine uh, expert within your network. And that's my trailer for Charlie, who's going to talk to you next. Thank you very, very much for that. Um, so before I um, introduce Charlie, I'd just like to remind you that any questions that you um, have for any of the speakers, please go ahead and um, put them in the Q&A um, and we will address them at, um, toward the end of the webinar. So, um, Dr. Charlotte Fries um, is a consultant physician in obstetric medicine and general medicine. She's recently been appointed as lead consultant um, obstetric physician for the Northwest London uh, Maternal Medicine Network. She spends a lot of her time um, educating others about obstetric medicine, particularly in geographic areas or medical specialties that are not um, that may not have much direct exposure or experience um, with obstetric medicine. She's, and that includes publishing a textbook um, titled Obstetric Medicine. Dr. Fries will be introducing, as I said, um, the new maternal medicine networks. Um, so over to you, Charlotte. Brilliant. Thank you very much for both the introduction and the invitation to speak. Um, so for the next few minutes, I'm just going to tell you a brief overview of what obstetric medicine is, what I do, um, and how meds maternal medicine networks follow on from uh, what you've just heard from Marion. So obstetrics and medicine incorporating medical specialties are very disparate areas um, of training. And people training in these two areas obviously diverge quite early in their training. But there is a group of women in between who overlap both specialties. But if you imagine those yellow boxes are the comfort zones of both of those specialties, these women fall outside the comfort zone of both um, the majority of people in both areas. So as an obstetric doctor, you may you, the majority of your work is with a um, is low risk women. You know, they uh, um, yes, high risk pregnancy is increasing in age, but low risk women are still um, you know make up the majority, and therefore you may not experience uh, see many women with medical problems when you do they're not that's something you see every day and they're outside your comfort zone and the same is true in medicine so uh, you may be very skilled in a medical specialty area but actually pregnant women are often few and far between with that specific problem and it, it causes no it is no surprise that um, someone who is pregnant causes much anxiety when they're seen in that non-obstetric setting for example in a medical specialty why is this relevant? Well, um, we'll talk about a number of um, problems with the care of these women as we go through. But the first thing is to say that this is a problem that isn't going away. This is not um, an issue that uh, we can just say, oh, well, it will get better in 10 years time for X or Y or Z reasons. Actually, it's going to be much more prominent. Um, and so not only are we seeing um, women getting pregnant, uh, the birth rate generally increasing. If you look at this graph shows the different age groups, um, particularly when you look at older women, the pregnancy rate is increasing. Um, but the age related comorbidities um, also therefore come with that age increase. Now, these are two charts showing the um, impact uh, of age and uh, the nature of 
older women having IVF and show that actually in every age group, the use of IVF is increasing and has done for over the last 20 or 30 years. But if you look at the proportion of the IVF, um, people undergoing IVF, actually the proportion of women over 40 is increasing as time progresses. Um, and again, you're taking a group that might be high risk for many or have medical complications for lots of reasons. And now they're becoming pregnant at a riskier time in their life. But we also know that pregnant women are reflecting the changes in um, weight in the general population. And they are also, we are seeing an increase um, in proportion of uh, pregnant women who are overweight and obese. And this is the kind of the best data I could find to illustrate those changes um, and showing that again, there's a difference between um, the area of deprivation in parts of Scotland. Um, but those that again, the rate of obesity and therefore obesity related comorbidities are also increasing. So you heard from Marion that we're seeing an increase in non-obstetric causes of death because we're doing better at managing those obstetric causes. Um, you've seen um, that in the, if you read Embrace reports, you'll know that we do find evidence of substandard care. And in every vignette you just heard from Marion, you, you sort of wish it was different because actually that care was not the appropriate care that woman should have received. Um, and we're seeing that medical conditions are more common. We're seeing a changing nature in the advice given to pregnant women. I think I hear from um, friends of my parents' generation who were told, oh, hang on, you have, you know, young onset rheumatoid, you shouldn't get pregnant. And they listen to that paternalistic um, doctor telling them that and they, they, you know, they don't get pregnant. You know, 20 years ago, people started saying, well, hang on, I've Googled it. Um, and actually women with my condition are getting pregnant. And so we've seen, you know, greater information sharing and a greater keenness to move away from that paternalistic view of medicine. Um, and women are then taking that advice, knowing people are doing it and getting pregnant. And then I think the next 10 years will um, see a great increase in the women with probably significant medical conditions undergoing IVF, because again, the risk um, thresholds that people are prepared to take in IVF is changing. But if we talk a minute about training, I showed you that first diagram of the um, people being outside their comfort zone with respect to training. Well, it, the problem is only gaining weight because our training in the UK is now increasingly um, keen for people to pick a specialty early. You don't have those years as a senior house officer um, sort of doing medical jobs, maybe doing some A&E before, uh, maybe getting some medical exams under your belt before becoming an obstetrician. That was very common 20 years ago. Perhaps it is not common now. And so actually both obstetri obst um, obstetricians, but also physicians do really have very limited exposure of that other area when they enter their training specialty. So this need for action has been highlighted at national level um, over the last few years. You've heard about Embrace, but also in reports like the Ockenden Report, um, recognising and describing women who really needed involvement of uh, specialty physicians with an interest in um, obstetric medicine, but also um, taking hold of those women, taking responsibility, because unlike um, low risk pregnant women who may need one consultant review, actually, these women need more than one review during pre pregnancy, potentially, and by the same person and by the right person who understands the care and the medical condition um, of that woman to make sure that they get um, everything they need during that pregnancy. And the lack of specialty input and um, multidisciplinary care is a repeated um, concern. So what about inequalities? Well, this is also important. You've seen some of this data illustrated already by Marion. But the key thing is that we have women who are more at risk from medical conditions in pregnancy because of their BMI or because of their ethnicity. Um, uh, but they might be in the place least able to access the specialty care that they need. Um, and again, if you look at the uh, impact of where the patient lives and the index of deprivation, then actually you'll see again that correlates um, and the women who are most at risk um, live in the most deprived areas. So what did the UK, or more importantly, NHS England do over the last few years to recognise this? 
Well, the first mention came really in the NHS long term plan where the idea of maternal medicine networks had been suggested and there was clearly national support for these to develop. And there are lots of principles this that I'll talk you through. So these, the aim of these maternal medicine networks were to divide England into 17 different regional areas. And the, this idea was nationally mandated and commissioned more locally. And the aim was to make access to a specialty um, obstetric physician and maternal medicine team uh, more equitable so that you could be a woman with a heart condition who isn't um, is in a living in a deprived area doesn't drive maybe not doesn't have a smartphone and uh, maybe doesn't speak English as a first language um, and that she should get the exact same care for that heart condition as a white Caucasian woman living near a tertiary centre who can access all those healthcare resources with her smartphone or driving all of those things. Um, and importantly, these apply at every part of a woman's pregnancy journey. So it's before pregnancy, chatting to that woman about their condition and telling them the risk before they conceive, but also importantly, the antenatal and postnatal care. And we really need to think about both the long term problems, but also the acute presentations to the emergency department or medical units. And the principle of making sure that the women can get the right care and at the right time and in the right place it runs through the idea of the networks. The model of the networks is a hub and spoke model. So uh, you have a one, sometimes two hubs or maternal medicine centers um, where you have a team that I will tell you about, but that there is outreach from that center to every hospital in that particular region to coordinate care and give those other hospitals the support that they need, not necessarily requiring great changes in their delivery of care, but giving them the support and formalizing that support if you need it. And this diagram just illustrates some of those things and ways you support those smaller units with you know they don't have to rewrite guidelines when people have written them and thought about them already so sharing the protocols and guidelines reaching out to the teams in that emergency department in those other hospitals to make sure that they are as happy managing those pregnant women as they might do if that pregnant woman turned up to a tertiary center well, who is actually delivering this care? Well, the NHS England mandate was um, involving some funding for a specialist obstetrician with an interest in maternal medicine, um, but also an obstetric physician with very specific training in obstetric medicine. So I did obstetric medicine alongside general medicine, but that's not the rule. People have done it alongside other medical specialties. The problem is that when they created the idea and divided England up into 17 networks, there were only about 10 or 11 obstetric physicians in the UK, so in, in England, so they needed more people. And so there was also, as part of all of this, NHS England investment in funding to take people consultant level or near consultant level from their region to, um, to enable them to train in a different region with um, established obstetric medicine centres and then return to be that lead um, obstetric physician for their network. But importantly, there are other members of this team. Um, there is midwifery leadership from the maternal medicine midwifery side, administrative support. We obviously work closely with obstetric anaesthetists and we have to build up our relationships um, with the specialty physicians from all sorts of specialties um, as part of that network development. The way we approach it is we, and this is taken from a London model, is that we divide all the conditions per specialty into a sort of A, B and C approach. So the default for A would be you would expect that those sorts of conditions could be managed in any hospital in the region and we would be supportive of that. If they are a little bit more complex, they might need input from the maternal medicine centre, but we wouldn't want to make the woman transfer their care or, or suggest they transfer their care to a tertiary centre further from home, practically challenging perhaps, unless they really needed it. So we might give input into their care. Um, but in category C, these are the women with the most complex conditions that we really feel the expertise of the maternal medicine centre is beneficial and they need to be um, cared for and ultimately give birth in a unit who have access to the appropriately trained maternal medicine specialty team, including those people I've mentioned. 
So where are we now? So we've made good progress in England, slightly thwarted by the pandemic and access of people moving region to train and coming out of their original specialty. But most networks have people in those roles um, uh, who've been there for a, very, a varying duration. Um, the consultants who were initially trained um, as part of that funding, have been most of them have been trained and are returning to their networks. But we, as we learn more about the network, everything becomes a bit more complicated. So this diagram shows you what we thought was pretty straightforward in the maternal medicine network of Northwest London, because there are six maternity units. But the more you look at the services that we need to reach out to and help and um, be involved with education of the emergency departments and the care, actually the, you know, the reach is much greater than perhaps you first think. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done. But excitingly, there's um, lots of scope to build up relationships with those different specialties um, but also importantly support the doctors who are in those other hospitals the aim of that specialty team I told about is not simply to take over the care of all of those complex patients at all it's frankly it's it's to be honest the reverse what we want to do is make sure that everyone in that network has their skills built up to make sure that we don't depend on those small numbers of um, specialists with very um, niche knowledge so in conclusion, the landscape of maternal medicine care is dramatically changing in England. And I hope that in 10 years time, we'll see those embrace reports and we'll see the impact of that on the care of those women. Um, if you are based in England, I encourage you to, if you don't know already, to find out who your local, what your local maternal medicine network structure is, who are those people that you need to reach out to in emergency, but also who um, would you like to work with educationally, learning about structure, do pathways need review, all of those sorts of things. For those of you who perhaps work outside um, of England, um, actually having a think about where your local care is now. This isn't necessarily a model that has to be put, um, uh, transferred exactly the same to other places, but the principles are fundamental of the nature of delivery of maternal medicine care. So thinking about how your care is currently delivered and whether some of these principles should lead to changes in that care structure are really important. Um, and the key thing is just building, I, I think a real key thing about this is building up those relationships, because that model that I showed you on that first slide of the obstetrics and the medicine being so far apart, actually we need everybody to be overlapping because that care of the woman who falls between those specialties and those gaps is not going to improve until we all work better as a unified team and know the knowledge and skills of the people around us. So I'll stop there and look forward to questions later. Thank you very much, um, Charlotte. Um, and so I'm moving on swiftly to our uh, last speaker today, um, Professor Martha Hickey. Um, Martha is a professor of obstetrics and gynaecology at the University of Melbourne, although she's currently hailing from um, France, so in the Northern Hemis Hemisphere. Um, she runs a large public menopause service with a particular focus on women with a history of cancer. She's also the topic expert <clears throat> for the UK NICE guidelines on menopause, and her talk is titled Empowering Women to Manage the Menopause, which is always highly relevant, but also um, just to point out that tomorrow is World Menopause Day. Thank you Thank very you. much, thanks. and over to you, Martha. Thanks, Abby, and thanks for including me in this very uh, fascinating seminar. I'm not talking about women's reproductive health, by the way, because this is... Um, post-reproductive health or most part of your life. So what's all the fuss about uh, menopause? And I have to direct that comment particularly to the UK at the moment where this subject is very, very uh, topical and hotly discussed. So like many uh, normal life events, uh, menopause has pros and cons. Uh, periods stop. You know, a lot of women, maybe up to one third, have menstrual disorders, they stop. Women don't need to use contraception, any, again, if that's been an issue for them. And the prospective evidence suggests that mental health improves as women enter the postmenopause. And of course, there are potential downsides. Um, some women, and it's estimated to be around 14% of women, have troublesome symptoms. Uh, those who have had previous major depressive disorders have a, an increased risk of recurrence. Uh, but over the general population of women transitioning menopause, uh, less than 10% actually experience an increase in depressive symptoms. 
So not an enormous uh, event considering um, the discussion that's happening at the moment. So I'd suggest that many factors actually modify the experience of menopause for women, their social meaning, um, what they're expecting to happen, uh, their own circumstances in terms of life adversity and stress, um, plus their general health. And, and very um, importantly, I think, the geographical area that they live in and also their racial background. And altogether, these factors probably have more of an influence on the experience of menopause than um, more biological uh, influences. So how did we get into this mess uh, with menopause? I'll go back a little bit and talk about the history because I think it helps to see the current circumstances in a bit of a historical context. So early on in the last century, um, women's physical and mental health that was considered to depend on their their own balance between either having uh, estrogen excess or an estrogen deficiency. And women with too much estrogen were advised to or did undergo oophorectomy. And women who were deficient in est estrogen required um, supplemental estrogen to be given to them. So when I googled uh, the effects of estrogen deficiency or the effects of menopause, I came out with this hideous uh, list of all of these different symptoms which have been ascribed um, to loss of estrogen over the menopause transition. <clears throat> but in fact, the evidence that these are attributable to menopause is very, very scant. Uh, what we do know is that hot flushes and night sweats are attributable to menopause, vaginal dryness, um, sleep and mood disturbances for some women, but whether that's secondary to a hot flush is, nobody's quite sure. So these other um, suggestions are really not part of, uh, not based on, on good, high quality evidence, but I think are quite widely propagated. And then just going back uh, historically to how we started giving women estrogen, um, these hormones were extracted from animals primarily. And in fact, Premarin, one of the most commonly used estrogens is still extracted from animals. It's from pregnant mare's urine. And the, the range of treatments, um, the range of indications for giving estrogen were very, very wide. Uh, you can see the list there. And just linking into the previous speakers, of course, we were also giving supplemental estrogen to women when they were pregnant as um with disastrous consequences. So in the mid 1960s, uh, or the heyday, I suppose, of HRT in, the, in Britain, about a third of women were taking it. And it was up to 40 or 50% in some other European countries and very much marketed as being something that would uh, keep you young um, into your old age with numerous uh, health benefits. And in 2002, um, that ended with the publication of the largest randomized control trial to compare estrogen with placebo. Uh, which was ended um, prematurely because of harm in both the estrogen only and the estrogen progestin combined arms. So that was a uh, had pros and cons, but it was a great example of research translation into practice because most women around the world stopped taking their uh, HRT at that point. So now we have a situation where we still see menopause as a hormone deficiency disease, uh, conferring short-term symptoms and long-term health risks. And we have a treatment available as HRT, but nobody wants to take it. Uh, I've been trying to find out how many women in the UK take HRT. I think it's gone up recently, but it's still, uh, it's still quite low. So it's about 15% maximum. So what I'm, I'm not going to go into the pros and cons of HRT and the potential risks and benefits, but I am going to raise the question about what else we can do to support older women if, if, if HRT is not the answer to all of those issues. So to, to set the point for why we should be doing this, why we should be considering this, I just want to reflect on the role that older women make, um, contribution that they make in our society. So they're the fastest growing sector of the paid workforce. Uh, almost all essential workers in health and education are women, and we've learned a lot about essential workers during the COVID pandemic. And 70% of voluntary workers are women, many of them older women. They also do, I say we also do most of the housework and caring. And, and we know that older women were disproportionately affected by COVID, partly because of these responsibilities. So I'm going to suggest a different approach. Uh, it's very new and it's something that we're just building up and, 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 and developing. 
but it's really around the concept of empowerment. And empowerment describes the granting of power, rights, or authority to another person. And empowerment has been used quite widely in health, mostly in the setting of chronic disease, and it seems to help. Um, it's been used in disease prevention, I'm talking about physical activity, also around uh, management of mental health, and in those chronic diseases that I've mentioned there. And it also seems to help uh, in terms of, of economic independence for those who are financially dependent on healthcare. So a strong argument for empowerment, but not previously used in the context of menopause, as far as I know. So this is an active process of women accumulating knowledge, confidence and self-determination and about managing their own health and making informed decisions. And if we're thinking about person-centered care, it's a, it's a key element of that. And also helps people potentially look after themselves more effectively. So if we think about empowerment uh, and menopause, um, menopause is a long-term condition. So empowerment is well suited to that. Um, it sort of may also potentially reduce healthcare costs. And in other settings, those who are empowered are less likely to choose invasive options, for example, surgery. So how can we translate this concept into clinical practice? Unfortunately, many women who see a physician uh, about their menopause report that they feel dismissed. Uh, the, the doctor doesn't really understand anything about menopause. They get information that's inaccurate and then they get offered treatments that don't work. So we're not starting from a very good place. And if we think about women who've had a personal history of breast cancer, uh, about 70% don't, who are symptomatic, they don't get offered any treatment. So what can we do, how can we do better for this section, growing section of the population? So I've just got some suggestions here we can we, that we could be doing. We could be providing better, more evidence-based and balanced information to women before menopause about what they might expect when it happens to them, because it will. Um, we could challenge some of the very negative assumptions at the moment about menopause causing rapid aging or women becoming depressed because those things are not true. And we could be encouraging routines that might reduce stress and improve mood generally, such as mindfulness and exercise, not as treatments for menopause, but as something for general health. And this is a new website that's come out of the US, which I think is a very nice way of allowing women to find out what treatments are normal, uh, what symptoms are normal, what treatments are available, and how they might self-manage their symptoms if that's what they wish to do. So I think as clinicians, things that we can do are to provide reassurance to women that their symptoms uh, are usually transient, not always, but usually are. We should be offering women who've got troublesome symptoms effective treatment. And I know many women in the UK say that they don't get access to that. Uh, we need to challenge the negative kind of views about menopause as being, a, being the end of the world. Consider treatments that aren't drug-based, like CBT, which are very effective for reducing bother with hot flushes, and also offer general health, uh, general information about health and, and sleep hygiene, and, and then challenge our own uh, ageist beliefs about um, older, older age in women being a period of decline. And in addition, uh, particularly in, international, in a multicultural setting like the UK, to recognise the diversity of women's experiences. And there are, as I said at the beginning, very major differences between women, uh, which are partly um, predicated on race. So what about after menopause? Um, again, offer treatments for those women that need them and encourage good general health and promoting screening. These are all part of our usual care uh, for older people. And I just echo what was said before, don't treat the woman differently just because she has menopause. And looking at what the components of this empowerment might be, uh, realistic information, partnering with your clinician, but I hear that it's quite difficult to see, even see a GP uh, in the UK. So women often have to do a lot of their own work in how they're going to find out about menopause. Practical support in the workplace is really important. Joined up care around prevention of disease and active access to effective treatments for those that need them. So just I'm just going to finish up by giving some practical applications um, of this issue of empowerment and how it might apply to menopause. Um, we see, a lot, in my clinical practice, we see a lot of women who have uh, carry BRCA1 or BRCA2 pathogenic variants. Uh, this woman in the photograph underneath her breasts has written fake and on top has written the real ones tried to kill me. 
And I think that's quite a realistic situation for, for many of these women. But they're advised to have their ovaries removed before menopause and they don't know what's going to happen and they're scared about the effects of surgical menopause. So it actually dissuades women from uh, this potentially life-saving surgery. So to try and address that, we've developed these resources. These are for patients who are considering risk reducing oophorectomy. These are for healthcare professionals telling them about surgical menopause and how to manage it. And these are freely available um, for, to anybody who would like to use them in their practice. We're also developing some guidelines for managing women after surgical menopause. And again, they're a forgotten group who, once they've had the risk of juicing oophorectomy, tend not to get followed up or seen and are at risk of long-term disease. So this was an art exhibition that I was involved with last year uh, about creating positive images of old bodies called, called Flesh After 50. This is one of the art pieces. Um, we had an exhibition in Melbourne using these different kinds of approach to art all along the theme of older women and their bodies. And I'm partly telling you this because I'm hoping there might be somebody in the UK who's interested in picking up on this theme. And just one further issue about empowerment of women that we need, we need to make sure that we recognize that women are reliable narrators of their own history. Uh, when I was a trainee, we were taught that if a woman said she had heavy bleeding, we had to cross-question her about exactly what she meant about that. But we now know that women present repeatedly with heavy bleeding and with pain and with other gynecological symptoms, and those are not taken seriously by their clinicians. So we really need to acknowledge that women can tell their story in these circumstances. So finally, this is a core outcome set for menopause that we've developed to try and embed women's voices in menopause research. And in summary, uh, we have ensured that um, the core outcomes that will be measured and I hope implemented in future clinical trials do reflect the priorities that women have raised uh, around menopause research. And this was uh, something global initiative across 28 countries, including uh, those from lower middle income countries. So women is the only common event that women have. Um, we really can't afford to medicalize it because that would be excessive for healthcare and potentially harmful for women. So with that, I'll finish and thank you. Thank you very much for that, um, Martha. So um, I'm very conscious of the time, but we do have um, one question. Um, in our Q&A, which I think, uh, Marianne, um, can I um, ask you to answer? And that is from Latha asking, what is the contribution of NIHR and its role in providing equality in women's health care, especially pregnant um, women who, as you mentioned, I believe in your talk, were excluded from the initial COVID vaccination studies? Uh, so a very a very good question. Um, I, I, I think I, I should just point out that obviously those initial vaccine studies were not run by the NIHR, so they were um, run by the the companies concerned. Um, I, I think we have to tackle this in a lot of ways. So we need to look at regulation um, to ensure that pregnant women are included by default rather than excluded. I think the NIHR does have an important role, and I'm certainly hoping that as the women's health strategy in the UK is sent, is taken forward, um, it, it becomes more embedded. Um, I have a, I, I lead one of the research for patient benefit program in, in NIHR, and I'm working with my panels to make sure that they're actually thinking about all of these aspects of inclusion when we're talking about uh, uh, studies that are being considered and and it's not just including pregnant women it's including women you know it's making sure that we're doing sex specific analyses when we're looking at cardiovascular disease for example um, making sure that we're we're funding um, uh, the research to look at longer term outcomes so I, I think there's a lot to do um, and and it's a challenge we have to take forward So I'm just going to conclude by thanking um, all of our panelists um, for today. It's been absolutely um, fascinating. Um, and as Marianne, as you said earlier, I mean, challenging um, beliefs and kind of preconceptions is has been a really important theme across um, everybody's talks. And thank you all for joining us. 
Um, and um, again, just a final reminder about the, um, the annual meeting in April in Liverpool. We will perhaps see some of you there. Thank you. Bye.